Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Monticello live stream. Today, we have a live Q&A with Bill Barker as Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Barker, Mr. Jefferson will be discussing Jefferson's 1801 inauguration and the early years of his presidency. Please add your questions in the comments and let us know where you're joining from. Uh, well, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon uh, and welcome to El Mondocello. I beg your pardon. Uh, I was more or less, um, well, I would like to say reminiscing about my first inauguration. I was actually reading my inaugural address. Do you know it is still said that amongst those gathered uh, in our Capitol building, that 4th of March, 1801, that those seated beyond the second row could not hear a word that I uttered because I, I read so intently my inaugural address. Oh, I had written it down, yes, but the purpose was in order to, uh, to give it to the news writers afterwards that they would then print my inaugural address word for word in their newspapers because otherwise, while I was reading it to those assembled, well, you know, there were many who only wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. I wanted to make sure that you, the people, could read distinctly what I had written. And of course, as a consequence, to make up your own mind upon it. Well, I am delighted that we are all together once again here at Al Monticello, delighted that Mrs. Boyer Melanie Boyer will be overseeing your questions and curiosities. And, and so without another further word from me, uh, until we hear your questions, uh, the floor is now yours, Mrs. Boyer. Mr. Jefferson, can you tell us about how you might have been our second president instead of our third and how the presidential election of 1800 that, just tell us a little bit about the presidential election of 1800 that led to your inauguration you were speaking about. Well, you're absolutely correct. I, I could have been our second chief magistrate of our nation uh, to have been inaugurated on March the 4th uh, in 1797. Uh, but that honor went, of course, to our former vice president and my old friend, John Adams. You see, I was not the victor in the presidential election of 1796. No, uh, though I had been brought into contest, in the contest with Mr. Adams as who would be our next president. Oh, I had been already retired here at Monticello. I never thought that I would enter public life again. And I think you understand why, because of the controversies and arguments and differences of opinion uh, between our former Secretary of the Treasury, General Hamilton, and myself. But no, um, the factions, if you will, political platforms had grown to such an influence that I was invited to come out of retirement and to stand opposed to our vice president, John Adams. And well, in 1796, uh, I lost that election. You know, as our constitution was originally written, whoever receives the second highest number of votes thereby becomes vice president. Now I declare, if there were ever a fault in our original constitution, that is certainly evident, and we corrected it, as we should. Never forget, our constitution is continually open to amendment, particularly through the voice of the people. That's the first sentence, we the people. So we corrected it with the 12th amendment, but that would not occur until 1804, after I had served four years as our nation's second vice president. Now, when you reflect upon the presidential election of 1800, that which ensued, well, I'll never forget, nor will many of us, how divided our nation was at that time. Uh, those four years as vice president saw increasing contentions, particularly between me and our president, John Adams. But the contentions had already been, they were the contentions essentially, between General Hamilton and me. Arguments over the growing deficit in our nation, arguments over the influence of a national bank, arguments over our treatment of our former ally, France, and arguments over what had become wars with the Barbary pirates. We were already having that. There were skirmishes and attacks 
uh, trying to extort from our free business upon the high seas monies so that our business ships would not have to be attacked. All of this causing our nation to divide itself so that in 1800, there were actually four candidates standing for the office of president. Now, some say two were vice presidential candidates. I don't see how that could be. Only one would wind up being vice president. No, the 12th Amendment had not occurred as yet, so there were four. President Adams' platform was divided by a former Federalist from New York. You know of whom I am referring to, Aaron Burr. And then my own political platform. Oh, I beg pardon, Aaron Burr, who was divided my political platform, the anti-Federalist. He had been a former Federalist. In fact, I was just reminding myself, he had come to visit here at Monticello, 1798, intent upon reading me out, understanding how I might stand for president uh, within two years. But no, President Adams' platform was divided by a Federalist from South Carolina, General Charles Coltsworth Pinckney. And who will ever forget all of the name-calling amongst those four candidates, all of the vitriol, all of the heresies, all of the twistifications of the facts in our nation's newspapers. Thank heaven we'll never see anything like it again. And when, of course, the popular vote came in, well... I was the one to receive the popular vote. But could things have ended there? No. No, remember, we have the electoral system uh, through our Constitution. And therefore, we waited for the electoral votes. And, well, as vice president, I was the one who opened the envelope to reveal the electoral votes in that presidential election of 1800. And what was revealed, we can hardly forget. A tie, a tie, not between President Adams and one opposed to him, but no, a tie between two opposed to President Adams, 73 electoral votes each for Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. For many days, our nation did not know who would be the next president. <laughs> but never forget, we survived. We survived because we are the American people. We survived because we followed our Constitution, which states distinctly, uh, such an occasion then enters into the House to be rectified. And it was with the creating of caucuses in our House of Representatives that the vote continued to break that tie and finally succeeded on the 17th of February, 1801, and I was then elected the third president of our nation. There were a few weeks then before the inauguration. That would be the 4th of March, 1801. I can hardly forget it, nor should we, because this is what happens as Americans. We continue to test ourselves and continue to enter freely into the political fray. Your next question, Miss Boyer. So you were America's first president to be inaugurated in the new capital of Washington, D.C. What was the city like at the time, and what did you find when you moved into the president's house? My heavens, our nation's new capital was a wilderness. Uh, the forest primeval, you might say. Yes, there had been a few farms there. There were some fields of cultivation. But no, when in 1791, uh, the act of Congress to create our nation's capital city as a result of the Residency Act. Remember, the Residency Act was one of the acts in contention uh, between uh, General Alexander Hamilton and myself. But when that was finally voted upon, uh, I then, as Secretary of State, uh, hired the surveyor Andrew Ellicott uh, to survey a 10-mile square district of Columbia upon the banks of the Potomac River, both in Maryland and Virginia. So by the time we moved our government there, officially, after spending 10 years in Philadelphia, uh, that would be the summer of 1800, coincidentally, during that presidential election year, can you imagine moving out of the civil setting of Philadelphia, one of the largest cities in North America, into the hinterlands along the banks of the Potomac River, Good heavens, all of the, well, the old pathways still muddy and hardly able to be traveled in, on horseback, let alone carriage or wagon. All of the 
the, the books of the Library of Congress, all of the furniture, all of the appointments of all of our government offices to be moved down into as yet unfinished public buildings. By that I mean not only the Capitol, but the President's house. Uh, seems nearly a, a phantasmagorical dream now that it could have been so as we continue to make more civil our federal city. No, I, I remember that uh, that spring of 1801, as I would be inaugurated president, I had already been residing in a boarding house. It was Conrad and McMunn's boarding house on the corner of C and New Jersey Avenue. I came down that morning to breakfast at the common table where were seated a number of the workmen who were employed building uh, our nation's uh, capital building itself. I took my breakfast as I rode amongst the salt of the earth, and then I gathered my inaugural speech, and I walked out of doors to be greeted by a small number of people, but in particular, a brass band, a band that was composed of members of our nation's Marine Corps. And along with the brass band and our, my fellow citizens, I walked but the few blocks to the as yet unfinished uh, Capitol building. It was only the, the north uh, part of the Capitol building that was completed at that time, which included, if you will, the, um, the, the justices chamber, the Supreme Court uh, and the Senate. Uh, and there we all met together in the, what is called the old Senate chamber. And at noon of the clock, at noon of the clock, I took the oath of office here upon my old family Bible, small indeed when compared to the very large family Bible of our first chief magistrate, uh, General Washington. But I took the oath of office with my hand upon it at noon of the clock by our newly appointed Chief Justice, John Marshall. They knew what they were doing, the Federalists, when they had but a few weeks left in August, office before my inauguration to appoint John Marshall. What is interesting is that despite the differences of opinion between Justice Marshall and myself, you know the two of us read law under Mr. George Witt. Not at the same time, Mr. Witt only took one student for a period of three years. But I think it's a testament to the integrity of Mr. Witt to teach the foundation of our law, which in its essence is English common law, to help us better understand that every generation has a right to argue and debate it and to create new laws. So I can never forget having taken the oath of office, it was then that I read my inaugural address. It was a time in which we needed to come together once more as Americans, despite the heat of that presidential election the year before. Well, speaking of the president's house, did you make any immediate changes to the president's house in Washington, D.C. over your course of um, your, your two terms as president? Well, thank you, Ms. Boy. I guess I, I do remember making almost immediate changes uh, when I moved in. The president's house was it yet unfinished. As you know, I was not the first uh, occupant. Uh, that was Mr. and Mrs. Adams. Mr. Adams first. He moved in that November previous in, in 1800. Uh, but you could still smell the, the, the new plaster. You could still smell the new paint. And, uh, and therefore, I was happy, if you will, to consider that as I would furnish uh, the president's house, uh, the Adams had already led me to know what might best suit uh, the house of the president of our nation. I say that because the Adams and I, remember, uh, were both in Paris at the same time for quite a few months before the Adams then went to live in London, representing our nation uh, at the court of George III. But we visited frequently between us while in Paris and both appreciated the more modern furniture, the French furniture of the period. Uh, that furniture made popular by Louis XVI, very of what might be referred to, I've heard, the term neoclassical, very clean and straight lines with a more or less a classical harping back uh, to the 
to the simple designs of the ancient Romans, that which we are continuing to discover uh, through the digs at Pompeii, the ancient Roman city consumed with the overflow of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. No, the initial president's furniture in the president's house, both through the Adams and later on through me, was French. French furniture, French appointments. So I set about immediately to decorate the president's house and then to realize in civilizing more the accommodations of the president, we should no longer have to go out of doors to outdoor privies. Oh yes, there were two of them. So I immediately had those outdoor privies demolished and then built indoor privies in the president's house. To make the president's house warmer because it was so very, very cold as the ensuing winter of 1801 and 1802 followed, I rumfordized the fireplaces in the president's house. By that I mean simply, uh, I built uh, the backs of the fireplaces out farther into the space. Because you see, with the fireplaces so recessed, a great deal of the heat would be lost and go right up the flue. So Rumfordizing, and this was a method that was initiated by a gentleman named Rumford, uh, provided the fireplaces to be more immediately in the room and the greater amount of heat then to radiate throughout the room. It meant not only building in front of the back of the fireplace itself, but also building the two sides inwards, providing a concentration of heat. Now, I am proud to say I also designed a wine cellar. Could that it have been within the president's house, say in the cellar or the basement? No, it was actually more or less an outdoor ice house. Um, one might look upon it and think this a great ice house, but in reality, no, it was the wine cellar. Uh, as you may know, Presidents Washington and Adams appreciated foreign wines, particularly the French wines. And so it was my de desire and design to have those wines immediately available in the president's house. I also thought it necessary to add on to the president's house. By that I mean it was somewhat um, rectangular in a very simple fashion. I thought it might need uh, some amendments to it, both on the north side and the south side. The north side, uh, Benjamin Latrobe helping me design a portico chair, which means a columned porch uh, built out that would allow access of carriages, a carriageway, if you will, so that you might uh, enter the president's house or leave the president's house during inclemency, rainstorms or snowstorms, uh, ever the warmer and the drier for it. And then on the south side, of course, to provide a colonnade along that south bay. I thought that would give it a sense of nobility and lift the human spirit to noble sentiments. You know, the south side is my favorite side of the president's house because it's the garden side. And when you talk about moving into the president's house, well, that south lawn simply became a swamp farther south from the south wall of the president's house. In fact, I remember from the Tiber Creek there was a little dock. You could pull up in your rowboat to the dock on Tiber Creek. You'd walk up the, uh, the uh, small dock there, and there would be a planked walkway, a wooden plank walkway that would lead you up across that swamp, up the south lawn of the president's house to wooden balustrades. The, the, the uh, staircases would come up from the ground to the formal floor of the president's house. The formal floor was not the ground floor, the formal floor was the first floor. And so the wooden uh, steps would take you up to that uh, reception, formal reception room on the south side of the president's house. Uh, so it was my desire to uh, more or less uh, fill in the swamp and, and provide uh, not only an experimental garden along that south uh, lawn, uh, but also, if you will, carriageways and a ha-ha. A ha-ha, of course, is an embankment that allows from you from the higher end of the lawn, looking south, uh, to look south to where there could be sheep and cattle grazing at the end of the south lawn, but no fear or worry that they might come up farther onto the lawn and greet you right there at the, at the staircase of the, the south side. No, 
because there was an embankment. You could see it much more clearly from the end of the South Lawn looking up to the president's house because there would be a wall uh, that would prevent anything from getting up over the wall to come further up to the president's house. So those are some of the immediate improvements that uh, I recall uh, making to the president's house. I, I lament to say that a lot of it I did not finish uh, during my two terms. Well, Bridget would like to know about the role of your daughter, Martha, while you were in the president's house. So can you talk a little bit about who occupied the president's house with you while you were president and what life was like there? Oh, indeed. Bridget, thank you for that question because I was uh, most welcoming of Mrs. Randolph and her family to come visit whenever they could. Of uh, course, um, my daughter and her husband eventually had 11 children. And uh, they would come visit at the president's house frequently, and there we accommodated all of them. My younger daughter, Mrs. Epps, would come visit with her family as well, though lamentably, uh, as she bore three children, uh, only one uh, lived to adulthood, and she became quite ill at the early age of 24 years and passed away, though not at the president's house. Um, she was home here in the vicinage at Mont Blanco, uh, where she um, eventually passed away. But Mrs. Randolph was of great support during my time as president. You see, I was a widower there. I did, my wife uh, did not live to see me either appointed uh, minister plenipotentiary to France uh, or appointed our nation's first secretary of state or vice president or president. And so uh, Mrs. Randolph was of, of great accompaniment and warmth and welcoming so many coming to visit me in the president's house. Mrs. Madison was also of great support as her husband, our secretary of state, James Madison, and she would visit often. And, and you talk of what it was like in the president's house, my heavens. Well, I can tell you this, there was always family, always family, people coming and going all the time. I would wager to say at any one particular point, during the eight years, the two administrations I occupied the president's house, there might have been 17 people living in the president's house. Now, this included those families who, who served as well in the president's house. And I mean that when I refer to the Hearn sisters, uh, both Edith and, and Frances Hearn, who came to the president's house. In fact, Edith worked with the French chef, uh, Honoré Julien. Uh, who had been General Washington's friend chef uh, when the president's house was in Philadelphia. Uh, Edith learned all of the arts uh, of French cooking there. Uh, she later married uh, Joe Fawcett, and uh, Joe Fawcett and Edith began a family, I think, totaling up to, uh, well, well beyond the 11 children my daughter, Mrs. Randolph, had. Uh, and then, of course, I remember that uh, Ursula Granger came down to the president's house uh, when I say down, I mean up. You're coming up from Monticello to the president's house in Washington City. She was but 14 years old uh, at the time. And uh, while she was there, she married uh, uh, Wormley Hughes, Wormley Hughes, Gardner, uh, and as well uh, a foreman here at, uh, at Monticello and Tufton uh, Farms. And do you know, I'm happy to say, that the first children born in the president's house. When we speak of families, and particularly during uh, the eight years I was living there, the first child born in the president's house was a young boy, the son of Ursula Granger and Wormley Hughes. And he was followed by the birth of my grandson, the son of my daughter, uh, Martha Jefferson uh, Randolph and her husband, Thomas Mann Randolph, and their boy we named uh, James Madison Randolph. So the first two children, lamentably, one enslaved, were born in the president's house during my two terms. I will never forget our coachman was an Irishman by the name of Joseph Doherty. Uh, he presided over my weekly rides with many ministers of state. We had quite a number of foreign dignitaries to come to visit us. I remember the Tunisian ambassador, Meli Meli, 
Oh, he came to visit the president's house frequently. He resided in Washington City for some time, I think more than a year, though he did not live in the president's house. He lived in a boarding house nearby, and he was renowned for the colorful raiment, his clothes that he wore so exotic there uh, in Washington City to the amazement and fascination of many visitors, not only to the city, particularly those who visited at the president's house. Robert Fulton was a visit. We had a delightful conversation. Uh, and uh, as well, the uh, 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 British ambassador, uh, Sir Anthony Mary, uh, and his wife, Elizabeth, I, I hesitate only because uh, they did not seem too pleased with my relaxing uh, of the um, formal ceremonies within the president's house that been, had been conducted during the administrations of President Washington and President Adams. And I will say, yes, I dressed down in the office of president. I rid the uh, office of the president of the weekly levies. They were formal levies, almost in a British fashion, uh, that were offered to the public who would come visit the president and yet were kept at a distance uh, in another room while the president and his lady would ascend on a dais, a raised platform, the doors would be open, and then the public would parade in front of them as a, a formal meeting. No, no, I would have nothing to do with it. And in its place, I welcomed dinners, a repast in the president's house. On the average, uh, three a week, commencing at half past three, and uh, there at the table, always a round table. Remember, there's never a head at the round table. Uh, so many of different opinions and from foreign nations, let alone our various states, would gather together and enjoy conversations in the realms of science and history and natural philosophy uh, and the like. Something that would be inspired as they entered the president's house because I decorated the entrance hall uh, with what is now decorating the entrance hall here at Armonticello. Uh, those relics and curiosities sent back to me by Captain Lewis and Lieutenant Clark and Lewis and Clark visited in the president's house as well. Talking about men of science, Alexander von Humboldt visited at the president's house, and we had lengthy conversations. And my good friend, the gentleman to whom I was introduced by Dr. Franklin while I was living in Paris, who came over to our nation to settle here with his two sons, Pierre Samuel Dupont, visited me in the president's house. And I hope you know that he was quite influential in helping to influence the purchase of New Orleans and Louisiana. So Bridget, I apologize. I rambled on in those reflections of the number who were living in the president's house, uh, of the great repast we look forward to, and for the continual excitement that we enjoyed in the president's house. One more thing, I must add this to you because the children seem to enjoy this more than anything else. Uh, uh, I uh, have ever enjoyed having flowers in my office. Uh, and so I would have exotic geraniums there in the window sills right there on the south side of the president's house. Uh, and people have asked me about my office, and I said it was on the southwest side of the president's house. Uh, the dining chamber was adjacent to that, uh, just to the, uh, to the west. And um, that I hear is now called the green room. Uh, there is a hallway that runs along all of those chambers on the south side of the president's house. Uh, and so, if you will, on the west side of the house uh, is, uh, was a grand staircase. That is where the grand staircase went up into the second floors and, and the living chambers. Uh, but I understand that is now created as part of a, a, a formal dining room, a very large dining room for the president's house. Mine was much smaller in what is called the, the green room. And I enjoyed having pets there, and in particular, my pet rocking bird, Richard. What a delight it was uh, to be able to see Richard at the time when most of us would go above stairs to retire, to go to bed. Uh, there would be Richard following us, hopping up one step at a time to make it all the way to the top. Uh, he was quite excited, the furthermore, so many of us, when uh, Colonel Zebulon Pike, sent me two grizzly bear cubs. Indeed, this was part of what he had discovered out west in his own exploration, 1806 and 1807. And so we presented them on the front lawn of the president's house, the north lawn 
They are the two cubs, cubs joyfully playing her within an engagement. Well, Mr. Jefferson, we've had a couple of questions about your presidency as well, um, switching topics just a little bit. So um, Anne asks if you enjoyed being president and Natalia would like to know what you enjoyed most about being president. So. Well, Natalia, I will answer you first. The greatest enjoyment of being president of our nation was meeting so many people. So many people I might not have met otherwise um, who came to our federal city in order to better acquaint themselves with our government and with the representatives of our people to better understand who we are and to see how we conduct government. So I'm referring not only to those from across the world, but I'm referring to those within our own nation who live afar. We only had 17 states at that time. But think, in March of 1803, I had the honor as president uh, to sign into our union, our 17th state, Ohio. And so those from the hinterlands of Ohio would come visit our federal city and visit at the president's house. So it was a great pleasure to meet so many fellow Americans, particularly as we sought to settle the farther west, to meet so many both from our northern states and from our southern states, let alone those in betwixt, to be more mindful of who we are collectively as a people, to be more appreciative of the great diversity of our population, which is our greatest strength. And I made mention of all of the, uh, all of the men of science and people uh, such as Mele Mele, representing most exotic nations to the East, uh, coming to visit. Now then, Anne, you asked me about, um, well, what the general experience must have been like in reflection. And I will tell you, that when I handed the gavel to Mr. Madison, that was the 4th of March, 1809, I finally could come home. That was the end of 40 years in public office. I would have never thought when I entered into public office at the age of 26 years, when I took my seat in the old House of Burgesses convened in the old Capitol building in Williamsburg, Virginia, there, the former colony of Virginia, the spring of 1769, that would be the beginning of 40 years. You can imagine it was a great relief to be able to know I could finally go home, to realize that there was great responsibility upon my shoulders to, to pull all of the farms, all of my inheritance uh, out of the growing debt that we were experiencing, much of it because of 40 years in public service. I remember all of the furniture, all of my books placed on wagons, then commencing the great wagon train that left Washington City, came down by way of Fredericksburg, from Fredericksburg, uh, west to Manassas, from Manassas down just east of Culpeper, uh, finally the wagon train to continue uh, from Culpeper down to Gordonsville, from Gordonsville then finally down to Monticello and here home. Well... When we all arrived in Culpeper, many will tell you, I said, head on to Monticello. I will be there soon. No one to this day knows where I was for three days. Three days, I could finally breathe, breathe by myself, reflect upon where I had been, and to bring to mind what needs to be done not only for my families, but also for our nation. How could I continue in retirement to be of service uh, to my nation? So I will tell you, Anne, in final reflection, <laughs> I cannot deny because I've written it, the presidency was eight years of a splendid misery. Everyone wanting something from you. You cannot satisfy all of the people all of the time, and it is most difficult even to satisfy some of the people some of the time. But that was my duty. It is the duty of a chief magistrate to understand that you are a public servant. You must help the people, particularly in protecting and defending us. An individual will never, ever bring out of the presidency 
the same reputation he brought into it. And that is what we continue to remind ourselves, to keep welcoming those whom we hope will preside in that office and help to support them accordingly, despite, despite all of its ills and responsibilities. Well, not to make you revisit uh, the splendid misery, but what were some of the immediate challenges you faced in your early presidency? Many may never remember this, but the most immediate challenge was to bring us back together again after a most heated and volatile, highly volatile presidential election. I reflected upon it earlier, how it was tearing us apart as an American people, how we were beginning to forget our founding principles. And so therefore my first responsibility, the first thing that I had to attend to was in my inauguration and to address our nation in my inaugural address, once again, reminding us of our founding principles. To admit in the very beginning of my inaugural address that, that I needed the help and support, not only of those in government, but of the American people. The, to admit humbly that I did not even think I was up to the great responsibility. I think that humility is often a great mark of someone who can prove to be, by the support of the people, a leader, an efficient leader. I reminded us that we are all Federalists. We are all Republicans. If you will, those are the labels to the political platforms, the factions that had grown up, which I've reflected upon earlier. Uh, our contests, our arguments, and our debates, and to remind ourselves man has never been more free to enter into these arguments and contests of self-government than we are as Americans. We are all Federalists. We are all Republicans. All oh, the labels of political platforms may change, and they will. But as I've said, <laughs> though we are referred to as anti-Federalists, though we've been referred to as democratical Republicans, though my particular platform is referred to often as Jeffersonian Republicans, I cannot, for any of those labels of political platform, let us be known simply as the spirit of 76. And that is what I read in my inaugural address, our founding principles, reminding us that we are the first nation in the history of man founded upon principle, not upon monarchy not upon nobility, aristocracy, landed gentry, principles of self-government, because that is an inherent right of man to govern himself. Of course, as well, I had to contend with what I remarked earlier, where the, the wars, the battles, our conflicts with the Barbary pirates, those who were safely harbored in the Mediterranean kingdoms of Tunis, Algiers, Morocco, Tripoli, and thereby to enter into a war with the kingdom of Tripoli, commencing as early as May 1801, but a few months into my first administration. Oh, it took us some time as well, four years to finally be victorious. And thanks to our Marines on the shores of Tripoli. But I knew then it would not be the end. No, President Madison had to suffer our, quarrel, suffer our quarrels with Morocco and Algiers and President Monroe in kind. I'm hopeful that his doctrine will provide us a greater protection and defense here uh, in our own hemisphere. Uh, and as well, to realize that we were denied the right of deposit on the island of New Orleans. We had no duties. We paid no duties on the Mississippi River. It encouraged our continual migration westward to assure our farmers that they would have a conduit for their produce. And yet, Right in the midst of the presidential election of 1800, we learned of a secret treaty having been drawn up between Spain and France, the Treaty of San Ildefonso. That was the reason why our right of deposit was denied us. The right of deposit meaning simply that a farmer could, could deposit his extra produce and warehouses in New Orleans, pick it up anytime he would choose to trade with the rest of the world. So as a consequence of this, I thought perhaps we ought to simply conquer New Orleans when I became president. Yes, I'm not going to deny that, but thank heaven, a gentleman I've referred to earlier 
Monsieur Pierre Samuel Dupont assuaged my fears. He said, Monsieur le President, you will flatter the French far more by offering to purchase. And so that eventually to the successful purchase, not only of New Orleans, but over 830,000 square miles west of the Mississippi River. And at the same time, my arguments and contentions with our former secretary of the, the treasury, Alexander Hamilton continued, oh, he had ideas of a standing army in times of peace. Well, I was not favorable to that. That would be a great drain on our treasury. But remember, if there was one thing that Alexander Hamilton and I understood was a founding principle of our nation, it is compromise. Compromise on behalf of the people and the common good. So I accepted General Hamilton's idea of a standing army in times of peace, if only to protect our trade wherever it may venture. But General Hamilton accepted my idea that that army must be led by a well-educated officer's corps. And so I will ever, be ever grateful that General Hamilton was still living when in 1802, I founded our nation's military academy at West Point. These are some of the some of the cares that greeted me as I entered the president's office, the cares as well to make certain that we could protect and defend our Western boundaries, even if we were denied the right of deposit on the, on the island of New Orleans. And so in a secret message to our Congress, January 1803, happily our government came to that urgency and we were able to provide $2,500 for commissioning an expedition, a military expedition, led by Captain Meriwether Lewis. You know, I will always be grateful that Captain Lewis accepted my invitation to be my private secretary in the president's house. And I will never forget when I set up a corner of the great East Room uh, as his cabinet, his office, let alone his bedchamber, that it was there on the floor of that great East Room that we looked over various maps, Mackenzie King's map, of course, uh, Aris Smith's map there to devise that expedition heading westward into terra incognita, unknown land. In fact, when Captain Lewis set out on that expedition, I saw him the last time, about three years later, when he left the president's house on July 5th, 1803, that Mr. Isaac Coles uh, from down at Enniscorty then became my private secretary and, uh, and his brother Edward to become private secretary to President Madison in time. So I thank you very much for these reflections upon indeed the good things that received my attention representing all of you in the intention of our, attention of our nation as to what we could rectify and compromise upon and to make better. Well, Mr. Jefferson, I think our time is about coming to an end, but any final advice you would have for future occupants of the president's house? Any advice that I may provide would simply sum itself all up in one word, education. Education supported by two other words, enlightenment, duty, vision to the future, upholding our founding principles to provide the greatest good for the greatest number. And those who occupy the president's house will never forget the first and foremost duty of government, protection, protecting people from injury by one and the other, otherwise leaving them free to pursue their own industry and their own improvement. And that improvement certainly led with what education provides, a knowledge of the facts, a knowledge of history, to remember where we've been, to better understand where we are, and to take risks, to continue to move forward into the unknown for what is possible. So this is one of the reasons why I think of, of the future of those who will occupy the president's house, the future of generations of Americans yet unborn, that it is indeed those dreams of the future that I enjoy much better than the history of the past. I thank you for being with us all here today. If you have an opportunity, uh, perhaps um, you might read my first inaugural address. Uh, there are many libraries uh, throughout our nation right now that uh, I want to carry it 
uh, in printed form. I would give you my own copy right here. But even I myself uh, need to refer to it uh, upon many occasions. I look forward to our next meeting here at El Monticello. And I thank you ever again as your humble and obedient servant. And I thank you, Mrs. Ma Ms. Boyer, for being with us today in our questions. I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson.